On the eve of the Queen's 90th birthday, as you heard in the news, Republic's chief executive, Graham Smith, oh, we invite him in and he really, he just creates a bad feeling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, don't want, yeah. I don't want to talk about republicanism on well, the Queen's healthy, 90th you know, birthday. You know, right, you know. I want to celebrate. I want to wave mm. a flag. Yeah. I know people are going to go, oh, you silly fool. But I think, see the big picture. This is a Hollywood that America can't create. They this, all want one. People who haven't got they it. do. Yeah. This is an institution that everyone wants but can't have. Yeah. This is an institution that Holland has but can't create like us. Yeah, you, can't make, you can't just make this. Anyway, because we're a fair-minded station, let's have him on. Republic's Chief Executive Graham Smith. He suggests that the Queen's passing one day, long into the future, ma'am, will mark a turning point in public attitudes. Boo, boo. 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 He suggested the country will need to debate what happens next, long before it happens as well. And earlier this morning, he spoke with another Republican, Julia Hartley Brewer. There isn't really an awful lot going on in the lives of the royal family. Um, they're not working hard, they're not representing the country particularly well, um, and they are, you know, helping themselves to millions of pounds of taxpayers' money, they are interfering in politics, um, they demand secrecy, uh, you know, they, they just, you know, there's pretty much nothing that I can think of that, that speaks well for the for the royals or the monarchy. Well, I'll give them something to think about, I mean, you say you're not working hard, I mean, she's 90 for God's sake, how many people are 90 doing anything? She's out every day waving, opening, chatting to people who she doesn't want to really talk to. And she's still working. And Philip, he, he, they, they drag him out. He walks around. I mean, that is hard work. When you're not, you know, most of us won't even get there. And we won't want to be woken up every day and go, you've got to fly here and go there. And, you know, that is hard. Is that not hard work, Johnny? Well, I think the Queen, she doesn't come out every day in her room. Um... Oh, all right. No, you've got to cut down a bit when you get to 90. I agree. But listen, yeah. they've got the best doctors and they have the best health regimes. And, yeah. you know, both of them have lived a long life so far. Um, but, um, yeah. You know, you today know. they were out waiting. The next few days, it's going to be relentless. They're going to be working dawn till dusk. You know, at listen, 90. At 90, even at 48. He's I, 92 or something, isn't I he? If I had a banquet there and I had to laugh at all of President Obama's jokes, yeah. I'd want a nice schluff in the afternoon. Charles I, is old enough. He's I, about must be 70 verging yeah, on 70 knocking on is 65 ish i mean god give him a bra william that's the only one i say come on william i mean uh you know stop flying your helicopter yeah. i mean he's, but he's doing good work with the helicopter isn't he he's rescuing people well, leave him alone actually yeah leave him alone as well maybe harry yeah have a go at harry yeah but he's the he's the spare isn't he yeah you need him and he hasn't really yeah it's true he's the only the spare well, let's examine the other side of the debate now. Joining us now, okay. Thomas Mace Archer Mills. Just one bloke there. He's chairman of the British Monarchist Society and Foundation. Thomas, good evening. Good evening. How are you? Very good, thank you. Now, Britain's Republican movement has revealed it plans to mount a campaign for a referendum on the future of the monarchy when the Queen dies. It strikes me, sir, that uh, the royal family is in a pretty good state and republicanism is on, is on the run at the moment. Well, the royal family is at the height of its popularity. And if we compare it to 1997, when everyone was fully aware of the Diana effect and how low the monarchy was, even at that point, the monarchy was never under 80% of support. So to go ahead and push the monarchy for a referendum as to whether we should be a republic or not, the public will not wear it. They don't want it. And now on the eve of the Queen's 90th birthday, the Republic's chief executive, uh, Graham Smith, suggested that when it happens, the Queen's death will mark a turning point in public attitudes. Um, he wasn't watching the recent tour of India, was he, with uh, Prince William and Princess Catherine, was he? It seems to be passing through the generations with quite some ease. There's a lot of popularity out there, isn't there? Well, that's exactly what it is. It's riding the wave of popularity. But just because the Queen will expire doesn't mean the love for the institution, which is held by the people, will diminish. The monarchy is an ongoing, ever-changing establishment, which the people and the successive generations take to their heart. It represents the best of Britain, British values, and the way things are. You'll never be able to extinguish that from the British people. But don't they, don't, doesn't the Queen and the Royal Family, don't they bring a lot to the table bringing tourism into the country? 
Well, they do to a certain extent, and that's one argument that I always shy away from, because if we look at what the royal family actually brings, it's a sense of pride, it's a sense of stability, it's a sense of continuity, but it also is an actual check and balance against an overzealous House of Commons and a political playground, which most politicians want to have. What about the perception of Charles as king? Because um, in terms of rating, he's not as high, is he, as the Queen, and certainly not as high as Prince William, although he is the stopgap king whenever he becomes king, which will be probably as a pensioner. <laughs> that is the truth. Uh, this man has waited his entire life to take the throne. But we need to look at his qualifications. There is no one more qualified to be the next head of state. He has learned from the best, and there's no doubt in my mind, or, or there shouldn't be a doubt in anyone else's mind, as to his love and sense of duty for the people of this country. What about Prince William? I mean, he's uh, he's very popular after Charles. Uh, isn't, isn't there a good argument uh, for, for him? I mean, he's very popular. Uh, he is very popular, but uh, this is what I always say. We don't get to choose our head of state in this country. It mm. is successive. And it states out perfectly clear in the Constitution. Okay, some will argue that it's not codified, but we all know the laws. We know the rules. It is one after the other after the other. The only way Prince William will be king is if something detrimental happens to his father or he decides to abdicate. And we all know abdication is a swear word to the royal family. <laughs> it is indeed. I mean, it's more common in places like Holland and Belgium. But uh, the fact yeah. of the matter is that the Constitution means that Charles will be the next king, however popular William is. Exactly. It doesn't matter. And, and you, bring up const you bring up continental monarchies. The difference between that is they're allowed to abdicate because they're only uh, inaugurated. They're not coronated where our, our sovereigns are. But isn't that a good thing that they're not actually voted in so no one can actually choose? It, it's, it's set in stone. Well, it is a good thing because it protects the country, it protects the constitution. And yeah. what it does is that it defines the country, it defines the era. We don't sit there and say, oh, well, you know, the, the Thatcher era and that sort of thing. Our eras are defined by our monarchs. The Victorian age, the Georgian age, architecture, Edwardian architecture, it's never after politicians, always after monarchs. Thomas, there's that old phrase, isn't there? You probably know it well. In a hundred years' time, there'll be four kings. The king of clubs, the king of hearts, the king of spades, <laughs> the king of diamonds, and then the king of England. The it seems to me that Norway and Belgium and Holland and Spain, maybe even Portugal, if they bring him back, they'll be gone. But yeah. our king of England and monarchy is number one, right? And it, it is number one, and that's because it is the oath to crown, to God, to country. And that's something that they take very seriously. Why do you think our institution seems to be more royal than other royals? What, what do you think it is, Thomas, in, in the DNA of this particular institution that trumps the Dutch and the Belgians? Is it, is it the simple matter of um, abdication or, or is there something deeper? Well, I, I would definitely say that there is a touch of abdication there. It, that is a learned behavior, and it is an acceptable behavior. Oh, I'm tired, I'm getting old, I will retire. The Pope even retired, but the Queen keeps going. And when we look at this, we look at continental monarchies and say, okay, you just want to give up, you want to enjoy life, where our monarchs, the whole life, whether it be long or short, is dedicated to the service of the people. With great wealth and privilege comes great responsibility. And that's something the Queen has always made good on. She is a very respectable, self-accountable and reliable head of state. And we are very lucky that we have her. And do you think Charles will be like that? Or do you think, as everyone thinks, he'll be totally uh, the opposite? No, I think he takes his duty very seriously, but I think we will see a bit more modernization and a bit of change under a King Charles. And I think that's something that uh, excites a lot of us to see exactly where he will take the monarchy, where he will place the crown and how he will actually do his quote unquote kinging, if you will. But Prince William wants to, today he was speaking about how he wants to run it like the Queen. So if it goes, if it changes under Charles, it might go back uh, when it goes back to William. 
Right. Well, it might. And, and that's also exciting because we never know which monarch is going to do what. They always put their own yeah. personal spin on their own way of, of reigning. And, and a lot of people have said the Queen exciting. has had a boring reign. She hasn't done much. Is that, is that what, uh, what's your view on that? <laughs> she hasn't done much. This woman has picked up the remnants yeah. of empire and made a 53 country strong Commonwealth of Nations. The woman has worked harder than anyone I've ever, ever known my entire life as far as politicians, as far as other sovereigns. This woman has been a, a strong woman in a man's world all of her life. She promotes the best of Britain. She is the most diplomatic person out there. And to learn from the age of only 25 when she became queen, she didn't have a life of her own. And this is why Prince William today, speaking about being work shy, says, the time for me to take on more duties will come in time. Right now, I need time with my family and to be me. And we have to respect that because the Queen didn't have that opportunity. Is there any argument, Thomas, for the idea that Charles is reign as king? Obviously, you know, we don't wish him any harm, but if he does get to the throne, it'll be quite short. Is there an argument for him to abdicate in favour of William in the future? No, I don't think so, because if we look at our history, if we look at the precedent that's been set down, there's been kings that have only been on the throne for less than 10 years, less than three years, sometimes as many as the Queen has been at 64 years. So no matter how long or short, they will rightfully take their place, because that's, that's the way it is in this country. Is there actually an option for abdication in the Constitution, or do they have to go on until they're, they're either dead or infirm? Well, there's always, always room for abdication, but that coronation oath is very, very important. And when our sovereigns, when our monarch takes that oath, whether it be long or short their life, it is dedicated service to the people. Just because they're tired doesn't mean they're going to forsake their people and throw everyone into a constitutional crisis. Edward VIII did that, and, and still people alive today have never forgiven that man. The European Republican movement obviously is something that uh, has access to the media and is popular, not least because the European Union is made up of mostly presidents and prime ministers. And the Republicans. <laughs> Indeed. The European Union, uh, if we maintain our role within it, uh, will surely mean that there will be continued pressure upon our funny old system here in England. Well, yes, yes, I think so. But if we look at the United Nations Index of the top performing and stable countries, seven out of those 10 are constitutional monarchies, which are in Europe. That has to say something about the credibility of a constitutional monarchy. So you think the future is safe for the monarchy in this country? I, I think it's definitely safe. As I said before, if the people want it, they will, they will have it. And Prince Charles himself has said, the only reason the monarchy here is here is because the people wish it to be. The people will always want it because that's what we do in this country. We eat, sleep, breathe and live our crown. Is it, gonna be, it is. is it going to be cut back, though, financially from, uh, from us? Are we going to have to pay less and they're going to have to support themselves a bit more in the future? Well, this is the sort of thing. If people really understood the way royal finances were and look at the crown estate and the sovereign support grant, that's money that doesn't have to be turned over to the state. And what people don't realize is that the money that's taken from the Treasury to pay the sovereign support grant was already deposited in by the Crown Estate before that payment from the Treasury to the palace was made. So, in fact, they fund themselves. He is uh, the chairman of the British Monarchist Association and Foundation. His name is Thomas Mace Archer Mills. Thomas, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thomas, Thank you for having me. How, how much in line to the throne are you with a name like that? I'm just sort of looking at it and thinking it's very noble. Oh, well, it's not even the top two, three, four hundred. Trust me. It's so not. you're actually in there. You're yeah, under yeah. thousand. Yeah, <laughs> I think we're all somewhere in the We're thousand. all somewhere. Yeah. Oh, we're absolutely yeah. nowhere, me and Ash. I, uh -huh. I, think, I think we're number 53 million. <laughs> right. That'll do. I'll, I'll take 50, 52,999,000. How, <laughs> how, how very humble of you, sir. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. <laughs> Lovely indeed. Thank you very much.